It takes quite a while for me to pay attention to any royal story. Often when I hear on the radio someone talking about Prince Charles, Prince Harry, whoever, um, I tend to switch off. However, in various situations, there are moments where my ears do prick up. Diana conspiracy theories, for example, and anything connected to her death, I will, I will listen to it. I will roll back so I can listen to it again. The Harry and Meghan saga has also kind of got to that level for me. I can't ignore it. I'm actually finding it fairly interesting. And the beef between Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, and the rest of the royals heated up today. That was with the release of a promotional clip from their sit-down interview with Oprah Winfrey. You know, for me, I'm just really relieved and happy to be sitting here talking to you with my wife by my side. Because I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for her going through this process by herself all those years ago because it has been unbelievably tough for the two of us, but at least we had each other. Yeah. I'm going to be watching that 90 minutes. That was a real dig, I think, at his dad because he's saying, you know, we, we've been dragged through the mud by the British press. We've had the royal family against us, but at least we've got each other. Diana had to go through that on her own. Should be very interesting. It also comes after an interview between James Corden and Prince Harry. That was last week. Um, they drove around LA on an open top bus. It was very much sort of like light entertainment, kind of entertaining. Um, Prince Harry in that blamed Britain's toxic press for pushing him to stand back from royal duties. Um, as is to be expected, all of this and um, Prince Harry and, and Meghan Markle resigning from, from frontline royal duties and then going and doing a lot of interviews with the American press. That's really riling up um, lots of Britain's red-faced talking heads. This was Piers Morgan this morning. Um, he tweeted um, a summary of his article for the Daily Mail. It takes a staggering degree of narcissism to play hard done by victims from your Californian mansion as the world reels from a pandemic and Prince Philip lies seriously ill in hospital. The only service Meghan and Harry know is self-service. Um, now, Piers Morgan getting angry at you know, a young, attractive couple won't come as much of a surprise. Although, I mean, obviously there are elements of, of truth in that as well. These are definitely not the two people who I feel the most sympathy for at the moment, um, even if the people who they are angry against, I kind of have even less sympathy for in this situation. However, going back to the media, it's not just um, the likes of, of Piers Morgan, you know, very outwardly um, ideological um, shock jocks. Um, to some extent. That's one of the things that Piers Morgan does, also does some good interviews. But it's also um, BBC royal correspondents who are sort of getting in and, and seeming really annoyed um, at Meghan and Harry, not particularly professional. This was um, Nicholas Witchell, who is the BBC's royal correspondent, explaining an exchange between Harry, Meghan and the Queen when they resigned from royal duties a couple of weeks ago. There's almost an unspoken sentence, which doesn't appear in the statement after that. A life of public service, like I have led, like my husband has led at the age of nearly 100, like the rest of your family continue to lead, but which you have decided to opt out of. Of course, they're saddened, as the statement says. They're deeply disappointed, I think, that this is how matters have turned out. And then the Sussex's statement, which concludes with these couple of phrases, we can all live a life of service, Service is universal. Isn't there just a sense there of thumbing their noses? Don't tell us how to lead our lives. So I think on both sides, Harry, I think, will now uh, perhaps finally realise the implications of the decision that they have taken. <laughs> he looked like he was going to have an aneurysm. I think Harry will finally realise the implications of the decision he has taken, thumbing his nose at the Queen. He does not realise the meaning of service. None of them realise the meaning of service. Let's be frank here. They're, they're all talking about, oh, you can, you can resign from the royal family and still um, live a life of public service. Whether or not Prince Harry resigns from the royal family, he is not living a life of public service. In both <laughs> cases, he's either living off taxpayers' money or he's living off advertising revenues from interviews he's doing because for the first you know, however old he is, 30 odd years of his life, he was living off public money. In any case, Ash, um, you know, they do, you know, people like Piers Morgan do have a point when they say these are self-promoting people complaining about the press and then doing very well, we presume in these cases, well-paid interviews with the press. So it is a bit hypocritical. At the same time, he's annoyed because the, the press and the royal family were terrible to his mother, who then died. You, you've got, I've got some sympathy with him. Well, where do you stand on this? Celebrities? Hypocritical? Wow, <laughs> I never.
never heard of the concept before. I think it's actually sort of useful to contextualize this and then and, and take a little bit of a step back. Because what's happening isn't Meghan and Harry escape the aristocracy. What they've done is that they've escaped the British aristocracy, which is deeply feudal, deeply old fashioned, wedded to systems of hierarchy, which you cannot separate from white supremacy because of the fact of the composition of the British aristocracy in order to enter the American aristocracy, which is made up of this kind of upper echelon of those who've reached the top of their fields, whether that's in celebrity, media, acting or politics. So they want to become part of this social strata, which includes the likes of Barack and Michelle of Beyonce and Jay-Z, of Oprah Winfrey, of Ellen DeGeneres. Now, this American aristocracy obviously is not feudal in nature. And it's the kind of product of this, you know, turbocharger that the age of celebrity and broadcast media was able to put on the careers of people um, and really get them to the top of the social ladder very, very quickly um, and compose this, this upper crust of American society. And it is a more racially diverse aristocracy. Oprah is somebody who is one of the most well-known and beloved figures in the entirety of America. She's one of the you know richest people in the country. Um, and that's why I think they've also positioned their media debut, you know, in the American stage with that Oprah interview. You know, it's, it's one step above even the likes of Gail King, who's somebody who attended Meghan Markle's baby shower. Um, it's very much saying, like, we are aiming for the highest of the high, the toppest of the top. And I think it's quite interesting that the sponsorship deals that they've Managed, managed to negotiate are very, very similar to the ones that Barack Obama and Michelle Obama negotiated for themselves. So I think that that's the story of what's happening. And then you can get dig into the personal character-driven elements of this. On the one hand, you've got Prince Harry, who is probably deeply traumatized by the death of his mother. And the phrasing of that interview preview, I imagine that there was a sense that he shares with his mom, who said this to Andrew Morton when he was interviewing her for the book, Diana, in her own words, that she was left unprotected by Clarence House when she was dealing with press intrusion, both before she married Charles and, you know, after their separation, she was really just thrown to the wolves. She had no money put towards, you know, her security. Or there was no sense of the Clarence House press machine stepping in to deal with the kind of, you know, relentless and negative coverage that she got. And I imagine there's a sense that that's what killed her. That's why the car was speeding when it entered that tunnel. And that's why that tragedy happened. And then this is me speculating a bit. I don't imagine it was straightforward for Meghan Markle, an American woman, a divorced woman, and a mixed race woman with a black mother to enter those royal spaces. And I'm not just talking about how she might have been treated by other royals, though we do know that Princess Michael of Kent, whose father was an SS cavalry officer, wore a blackface brooch, an Orinoco brooch, uh, for the first time she went to meet Meghan Markle. So that's how racist they are. They have racist accessories. I imagine that also that intensely hierarchical, ritualized social setting of the royals and what goes on in their palaces was also something that was very difficult to deal with. And again, this is something which Princess Diana spoke about. She absolutely hated it at Balmoral, where you had this insane level of social ritual just for sitting down to dinner. And if you spoke out of turn, you know, even the servants would make it very, very clear that they disapproved of you. And so when you add to that, the kind of uh, cultural and racial otherness of Meghan Markle, I bet that that was fucking horrible. So why wouldn't you, if you were hot, 
if you were rich, if you were media savvy, go, you know what has a, let's just fuck this off. You've got this dying, decaying British aristocracy. And what we could do is make this leap into the American mediatized aristocracy instead. I'll be rich, you'll be rich. And also people aren't going to treat us like shit all the time. How about that? Um, and also perhaps we won't have a media culture, which is going to kill me like they did your mother. I imagine that that would be very appealing. Ash, you've really earned your title as Navarro Media's royal correspondent because that was actually the best analysis I've heard of of this whole Ferrari so far. You've really cut through the crap. I have a, a video from from Twitter that I'm going to show you in a moment, which um, really I think shone a light on on the historic beef between Prince Harry and the media, which I thought was very revealing. If um, you are enjoying this video and uh, make sure you subscribe to the Navarra Media channel because you get all sorts of analysis from the likes of Ash Sarkar and it's not always about the royal family and her analysis of British politics and American politics is just as good um, as, as Prince Harry and Meghan, I promise you. Let's take a look at this clip um, which is a compilation um, I saw on Twitter this weekend of Harry's historic beef with the British press. Unfortunately, um... Every single story was complete lies, which it rarely, well, which it always is, basically, which is a shame. But, you know, it's something I'd love to do, and, you know, now I've had the chance once, I'm, I suppose I've, I've got quite into it. Um, and at the end of the day, if you join the army, you expect to go on operations. I don't want to sit around at Windsor because um, I just generally don't like England that much. And, you know, it's nice to be away from all the press and the papers and the general shite that they write. It's too risky for you to go back as a, as a soldier. Uh, more the fact that I think the media have said that they would never keep their mouths shut um, if I went and did the same job, so I'd have to do something different if I wanted to go, yes. With the media following his every moment, Harry can't hide his irritation. How are you enjoying getting stuck in? Not really with you guys. The tour of Afghanistan, Harry's exasperation, even loathing of the press, has shone through loud and clear. By far, it always says don't read it. Everyone says don't read it because it's always rubbish. I'm surprised how many people in the UK actually read it. Um, I mean, everyone's everyone's guilty for buying the newspapers, I guess, but um, hopefully no one actually believes what they read, <laughs> um, which I certainly don't. But yeah, of course, of course I read it. If there's a story and something's being written about me, I want to know um, what's being said. Um, but it, all it does is just upset me and anger me that people can get away with writing the stuff they do, not just about me, about everything and everybody. And that, that mistrust of the press, I mean, how far far back does that go? Is that something that's... that's to the I think it's fairly obvious how far back it goes <laughs> to when I was very small. That was spicy. I rate Prince Harry a lot more after watching that. I have to say, I was always like, you know, I don't have any skin in this game. The whole game between Prince Harry and, you know, the American establishment and the British establishment, whatever. But seeing him there say, you know, I generally don't like England that much. And then, <laughs> and, and the end, I mean, how powerful was it? It's, it's obvious how far this goes back to when I was very small. And as Ash was talking about, that's because of the way um, the press and, and the Windsor family treated his mother. Um, Ash, what did you make of that clip? Had you seen it before? Was all of that familiar to you? It was, I think for me, what was surprising is seeing it all compressed like that, is seeing how little he felt inclined to mask his disdain for the British media establishment. He's not the only royal to have been critical of the media. Prince Charles, I think, was picked up on a mic calling Nicholas Witchell, the BBC royal correspondent, a dreadful man. Um, it must feel awful to be a royal correspondent, to dedicate your entire career to suck in establishment boot and then just to get kicked in the face like that, you know, in a drive-by, my God. Um, but I think that it was when it's put together in that way, you can see this consistent threat of this, how my mother was treated. And then it makes a kind of sense of, I can see the woman who I've married, who I love, who I've chosen to have children with, being treated in a way that I think was of as being very similar. I think that it's something that all of us can imagine and empathize with, if not from a position of direct experience. And I also think... This is, again, me speculating, but I've ranted to you before about how against boarding schools I am, right? I just mm -hmm. think they're fucked up. I just think it's completely fucked up to send your kid to a place where they're going to be bullied and potentially abused. When that happens because you've taken kids into the care system, people generally go, you know what? That's a suboptimal way to raise children. When the ruling class do it with their kids because they send them to boarding school, it's like, ah, yes, they're prioritizing their education. But I do think that it is really traumatic. You add to that the fact that 
you know, your mother who was famously unusually warm with her children and unusually loving has died in this horrible public way. And then you've got this completely fucked up family dynamic of, you know, strange, cold, emotionally stunted and warped people around you all the time. And then you manage to fall in love. You manage to fall in love with this beautiful woman who's successful in her own right. And you can feel the walls closing in and these horrible, distorting, you know, the effect of media coverage on on her mental health and your mental health. And you add to that the family context, obviously you'd be chewing your own arm off to get out of there. You know, this is why I think that the monarchy ought to be abolished is really for their own good. I think it's a completely fucked up way to have a family life and you need to get rid of it, save them from themselves, turn Buckingham Palace into a Weatherspoons, we'll be happier, they'll be happier.